Join us now at the glorious Symbiosis Gathering 2013, a chill and energetic fall equinox festival on the crenellated shores of Woodward Reservoir in Oakdale, California. The Pantheon stage there hosted many talks, and on Saturday afternoon strode out yours truly, Dr. Bruce. Introduced by visionary activist and coyote spirit woman Caroline Casey. I woke up that morning wondering what on earth I had to offer, and it came to me to thread together several tales. So here it is, the weaving together of the story of the birth of the visionary experience 300 million years ago, to the madre seeing through our tiny primate eyes for the first time, all the way up to the dreamed-for ascension of us monkeys in some sort of union with the universe. These themes were also covered in four longer wraps at the Burning Man Festival just three weeks before symbiosis. I have decided to bring those to you after you hear this higher-level symbiosis synthesis. Just before we get started, as you will note, there was a special guest in the audience that day. It was none other than Dennis McKenna, who took in my talk before going on to deliver his own, recorded presumably for broadcast elsewhere. As Dennis's brother Terence McKenna was somewhat of a mentor for me, it was an honor to have him there for me to gift the fruits of so much intellectual and experiential labor since Terence and I last connected on these subjects. So now, onwards to ascension. He's designer, scientist, vision, imagination. Yes, yes, he is the part of our team who has all those things. Delivered blueprints for asteroid and lunar missions for NASA. What does that mean? You actually just handed it to them and... <laughs> Excellent. Designed cyber garments for professors of fashion. Charted the entire history of computing. Pioneered the first meetings in Avatar Cyberspace. Built some of the earliest user interfaces on personal computers. Drawing from our brother Terence McKenna's notions of novelty, he went on to create the Evo Grid, a novelty conserving engine. More on that, details mm -hmm. 11. He is known worldwide for his provocative talks. Uh, Bruce and his partner Galen live on uh, Santa Cruz because that's where you gotta live. There you go. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, thank you. So, this is a bit of an experimental talk. Are you willing guinea pigs? Yep. <laughs> okay. This talk is going to take you on a romp through a great period of time. So, what do you notice about me when I walk back and forth? What do you notice? You're not saying it. You're not saying it. No, no. What? What? Colors. Lots of colors. Spiral colors. Flashy colors. When I walk this way, all you primates, all your eyes follow these colors. So where did this come from? Where did this in enamoration with color come from? I think we found it. We found the nugget. And it goes back 300 million years. 300 million years ago. If you came into orbit, what would you be seeing? Anybody know? Stegosaurus? No, no Stegosaurus. A bunch of water. Bunch of water. Bunch of water. Uh, what else would you be seeing? Chunks of land. What would be on the land? Mushrooms. Huh? Mushrooms. What mushrooms? Uh, too too soon for them, actually. Lots of green, 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 green. Three hundred million years ago. But what wouldn't you be seeing? Color. Not a lot of color. Why? Because. The plants, which are basically the ocean on the land, there is this theory called the hypersea theory where plants came up to the shore and they were algaes. And they were like, look at all that real estate. You know, how do we get there? Well, we have to grow ourselves up there and we carry in our phloem and xylem, we carry the ocean. And so basically plants are the hypersea. They're the sea on the land. And they, you know, had more access to wonderful energy sources like sunlight. So. 
the plants managed to do that. They managed to take over the land. Fern trees 100 feet tall, cycads, really bizarre looking plants. But all these plants were, were there and they're like, wait a minute, we can't walk. We can't have sex. I really like that cycad over there, but I can't get to her. Why can't I have sex with her? And what the plants had to do is they had to seduce the insects. And the way they seduced the insects was one day out folded a leaf, and that leaf was pink. Pink was the first flower, by the way, so all you ladies note. You know, it's the primal sex color is pink. So because we know this from ancient plants that are sort of still around, they have like pink leaves. The pink attracted the insect mind to come to it because it wasn't green. The insects landed on that thing, and the plants had evolved a little thing called a stamen, which had little dust on it. The insect was like, oh my god, I can't get this shit off of my legs, and it would go, but I'll go on to the next plant, and they could have sex for the first time. So within three million years of the invention of the flower, the planet exploded in color. Unbelievable color. 300 million years ago. Roll the clock forward. What happened between 300 million years ago and 65 million years ago? Everybody know? Great big lumbering things called dinosaurs. Big boring things called dinosaurs filled all the niches. Everything had started out as a, as a four-legged thing called a tetrapod, and then the lizards went off that way, and the poor amphibians went off that way. They couldn't quite get out of the water, and then the dinosaurs took the main line. They took over the system. So if you think about the Earth as a living system, how many believe that there's sort of a living consciousness, the whole planet? How many people? Well, what would the biggest... Where would the brain be of that living mother? In the plants, in the roots, in the mycelia, in the plants. It's the biggest system. What feeds off those plants, animals, insects, and whatnot? She tolerates us. Somebody's eating a salad back there. She's tolerating being eaten uh, for the benefit of this uh, wonderful parasite back here named uh, Carl. So. Get this picture. If the planet is coming to consciousness, it's coming to consciousness inside plants, inside the plant mind, the plant body. So the plant body is gradually coming to consciousness and realizing, oh, I'm vibrant, I'm, they're eating me, but, you know, it's going on, where is it going? What is her goal? What is her goal? Can anybody answer what, what, what would the planet's planetary consciousness goal be? Independent of our, our goals. To go to other planets. Right. Find a new home. Make a seed and make another colony. So this is the entire drive behind everything that we're part of. It's a bigger drive than us, than our need to go to fast food and pay off our mortgages and fight fracking and things like that. The bigger need is that the planet needs to make a new home and needs to make a copy. Terence McKenna talked about novelty conserving engines and how complexity grows in the universe. And I did work in the last 10 years to find a formula that characterize how that actually happens. If you run that formula from cosmogenesis, from the first simple particles that are fluorescing outward, you run that formula, you get to this complexity, you get to symbiosis. It's incredible, right? It's an amazing thing. It's bigger than we can know. Our little monkey minds can't see the full complexity. Maybe an elevated monkey mind, you can get a flash glimpse at the full power of the complexity of what we're in, but we can't see it. It's much bigger than we can even comprehend. So, fair to say that the mother, the madre, the planetary plant body, she's got a rockingly great consciousness. She's huge, bigger than we can know. She probably puts little samples, little, little movie reels in our heads now and then. It's much bigger. Assume that. So as she's coming to consciousness, as the forest is growing, as, as the, the seas are filling with animals and plant life, this thing that is coming to consciousness wants to get a look at itself. 
How does it get a look at itself? Through the eyes of the creatures that feed on her. It's like a mirror. So she, she picks the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs are lumbering along, and the dinosaurs aren't, aren't particularly good. Some of them can see in color, but they don't have very good vision. And they're kind of focused on eating that swamp or not getting eaten by the, that thing that's coming through the swamp. So guess what the first creature that has binocular vision, that means eyes in the front of the head, that can see in color, and that has a rockingly good little brain to see shit. You know who that, what that is? That's us. That's us. But it's us 90 million years ago. They found a femur bone about that long. That's a, a bone from the leg of a 55 million year old protoprimate, the ancestor of us all, living in the trees, eating insects. So our life was living on forest canopy branches, hunting insects. So a dragonfly was a major kill. It was an incredibly big meal. And then we would crunch down leaves and we would suck tree sap, sugary tree sap. So we had a burger, fries, and a shake diet in that period. 90 million years ago before that, because the genetic code shows that we go back that far, before the asteroid at Chitflub that destroyed the dinosaurs, we were around. We were just living in the forest canopy, having our burger, fries, and shake diet. The dinosaurs are lumbering down on the forest floor, and we are looking at all of this. And it's my conceit, my dream, that through the eyes of this protoprimate, I call her Overdrive, the teenage, three-inch-long ancestral mother of us, the Madre first beheld herself. She beheld the rainforest. Because any girl wants to know how she appears and looks to others, right? So one of the things that insectivores do in the, in the jungle, and you can watch insectivores at work today, is they'll dart out on the tree limb and they'll try to get food. And I dreamed that, that Overdrive, she left the bundle of protoprimates huddled together for comfort, and she ran along the limb in the morning to suck down the globule of, of sugar to get high. So here she is, she's on that limb, she's sucking down that globule of sugar, she's looking back at the community because she's going to get busted if anyone sees her, sound familiar? She's sucking that down and she's looking forward, her brain is activated. She's now seeing in a higher level, she's got all that glucose and beautiful stuff in her brain. She looks forward on that limb and what does she see? She sees color patterns. What are those color patterns? Well, it could be flowers and things like that. They are very tripped into this, these protoprimates. They are programmed for this, but what she is seeing is something much more ominous than flowers. She is seeing the scales of a tree snake. The tree snake was the arch rival of us for 35 million years in the jungle. The tree snake co-evolved with us. And the way that the tree snake operated was to hold very still on the branch until the protoprimate looks forward and gets mesmerized by the scale patterns, really tripping out on those scale patterns while drinking their tree sap. And the head of the tree snake comes underneath the branch and comes up and snaps her ass down. And this has been going on for 35 million years. We're still in this dynamic today. What is that snake? If I hold an iPhone up here, if I put a multiplayer game on the screen or I put on my Google Glass, what am I looking at? Lots of color pixel patterns. But we're total suckers for this. We love screens. We love color. We'll follow it anywhere. We're still mesmerized by the snake. What the snake is today is called technology. It's called media. 
So this is the snake. And the dynamic is that the snake is eating our attention. It's eating our asses. It keeps our asses planted firmly on seats in office cubicles while it consumes our very life energy, right? You're stuck in a call center, right? That's the snake that's consuming your ass just as it was 90 million years ago on the branch. So this is the dynamic that we are stuck in still. So how do you break it? Well, let's roll the clock back again. Let's go to the 64.9 million years ago. So the madre, the planetary plant body, the goddess, what you would call her, is bored with the dinosaurs. She's totally bored with the dinosaurs. Why? Because the dinosaurs are not going to meet her objective of getting another home, getting to another world. They're very self-centered. They're... They eat all day, and then they get eaten by other things, and there's nothing's ever happening. There's no evolution happening. They get big. They get small. They... She says, if I keep investing in them, I'm done for. The last time she invested in a lot of biota were the trilobites. The trilobites are these crazy things with shells that, that crawl along the bottoms of the shallow seas. And there was one that was about three, four feet long in the Cambrian era. And she offed them. She, she took a, a big hit at Antarctica to get rid of those suckers. And it took quite a big hit. They had to boil off about 400 feet of ocean to get those suckers out of the picture. So she's bored with the dinosaurs. And she just had a look through the eye of overdrive. The young protoprimate, she saw herself. And then at night, overdrive was walking along the limb and looked up and she saw the stars. So the Madre realized where she was in the cosmos. So she said, they're the ones. I'm going to keep them. So what does she do? She orders up that asteroid strike and those Martian bacteria that can steer the things like, all right, what size do you want? She's, uh, three kilometers. You know, they're, they're metric, of course. You know, back in those days of Everybody was metric. So three kilometers, 3K. No, 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 5K. I'm a little nervous about it. I've got a bigger hit. And so in comes this, this, this bolide, this asteroid. And a friend of mine modeled this on thousands of computers. You can see the show in New York at the Hayden Planetarium. And this thing comes in, and it hits at Mexico. It hits in the Yucatan. And picture the Madre. She's got her lawn chair, and she's sitting, waiting for the impact to come. It's a big show. The forest is all around her. In comes this bolide. It penetrates the Earth's crust. She goes, good, good on you. This is a good one. She sees the two-mile-high sheet wall of magma rise. And good, you know, second phase. This feels really good, too. And to her horror, she's ordered a too big of a hit which sometimes happens, let's face it. Because what rises out of that sheet wall of magma is a ball, a droplet. And the droplet is pure molten Earth's crust. And it's about a mile across, and it's headed for orbit. And she realized, I fucked myself. I'm totally fucked. Because this thing goes to orbit, it breaks up into a spray. And the spray is individual molten rock mountains that come down like hot sperm onto her egg. But this hot sperm burns the atmosphere. It boils off 30 feet of ocean and it burns all the forests. And just before the Madre goes unconscious, before she goes black, she says, what was I thinking? These binocular protoprimates that I fell in love with live in the forest canopy and now all over the planet are raining mountains down on their heads that was us this really happened so she goes unconscious because the whole planet's on fire the surface of the earth was 500 degrees 30 hours after this impact because of this spray that came down and burned everything so she goes out Miraculously, the planet had enough juice in it that within a few million years, the atmosphere cleared. 
the whole system reset, and there were forests from pole to pole. A great primal forest rose, and she returned, and even beyond comprehension, we were still there. We were around. How did we make it through? Did we climb into a hollow log? How did we get through the one year of no sunlight kind of thing? It turns out that we, we had a skill that always allows creatures to get through these catastrophes. We could eat trash, <laughs> which we're still doing <laughs> today. We could exist on any gosh awful thing. So we ate all the parts that were falling down and the, the, the fricasseed dinosaur femur bones and the various pieces that were coming, the half-cooked fruit and things like that. So we made it. We made it. Does this make sense to everybody, this story? What is the tr- what's that? The trash, the trash was everything that burned. Barbecued dinosaur, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Which we still like a lot. I mean, I crave barbecued dinosaur. It's called chicken, Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> didn't have the nice bread. It was, it was blackened chicken then. So, so roll the clock forward. We've made it. Now what happens is the Madre's amazed that we've made it. We start evolving. We start evolving quickly. We come down out of the trees. We leave our brethren behind in the trees, the lemurs and the monkeys and whatnot, and they're still having to deal with snakes. But we come down out of the trees. We put snakes in our mythology later. Of course, you can see them everywhere. In fact, if you walk along and you see a snake on a path, you jump back even before you know it's a snake. It's completely automatic. It's hardwired into you. This is why there's snakes in the Bible. There's snakes in, in South American ayahuasca tradition. It's a very powerful driving metaphor for us. But what happens? So the Madre's goal, what's the Madre's goal? To find a new home. How does she do it? We have to use the technology that she can then use to find the new home. But in order for us to do technology, she notices that as the brains are developing of our ancestors, you get kind of ancestors that are a little mellow, called the bonobos. They're kind of like these folks here over on the pillow. They just love to lie around in the family unit. They're just so happy about everything all day. But are they out there doing startups and building rocket systems? No, they're just having a good time. So she has to find a way to introduce into this monkey's brain a little bit of mania so that we'll get off our derrieres and we'll actually build stuff. So in the branches, we have the bonobo. That's peeled off. They live in Guinea and places like that. Then you have like lowland gorillas and things like that. They're pretty peaceable. They're vegetarians. She realizes, no, none of them are going to do the the deed. I have to branch off kind of a crazy branch. We're branched off, and then the chimpanzees branch off. The chimpanzees are crazy. You know, at Gombe... What did Jane Goodall find? There were wars in chimpanzee communities, full-on wars. It totally shocked the primatology world to discover that there were full-on wars, and various crimes and misdemeanors, and even more serious in the chimp community because of, like we're looking at a mirror of ourselves. So <clears throat> we're kind of crazy. So what happens? Roll toward the 21st century. Roll toward today. What are we doing right now? Can anybody give me a clue what I'm doing to you right now? Anybody have an idea? Brainwashing. Brainwashing, that's true, but what else am I doing? Dismantling consciousness? consciousness? No, I'm doing something more primal that we don't do much nowadays. Telling stories. Even more primal. What am I doing? Stimulating consciousness? No, you know what I'm doing? It's an amazing thing. I'm making eye contact with everyone in this room and you're returning the eye contact. Except the people wearing glasses who don't get kind of their eyes closed, for all I know. Even with dentists there, I'm making eye contact. Making eye contact. So, 
we're making eye contact. Guess what? That's the primal way by which we have built our communities and our sense of self and how we preserved ourselves is through eye contact. What is happening to us in this time is this thing is coming between... See, grab, grab my phone. Where is it? Oh, i got to do it. i got to take this call. So, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I... You just got to take this call, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's so important and everything. Eye contact broken, right? You're all thinking, shit, he's on this call. I can I take a call here, too. We got 3G here. and Maybe the fucking network's working a little better than it was. I couldn't upload the Facebook picture. and But, you know, since he's taking a call, maybe I can. What that's doing is it's abrogating eye contact. It's a huge deal that... We're losing eye contact. And I was recently in Peru, and I had a conversation with the Madre. I said, Madre, your best laid plans for getting a new home, which rely upon the most powerful network of community and communion and connectedness in, that you have developed, which is eye gaze, you know, the eyes, the windows of the soul, etc., etc. You're losing the network. That network is going dark. Because not only are people holding these boxes and looking at pixels all day, we're training our young, some of our young, to do that from a very early age. So they're totally trained to, to do this. In the 1950s, if you'd applied for a research grant, where you'd say, well, we'll take children of ages 3 to 10 and we'll put them in this room and we'll give them these, these boxes that have TV screens and we'll flash pictures on those screens and these children will have to look at the box at least 200 times a day or maybe 300 times a day and interrupt their thought and what they're doing and just pick the box up and look at it. You couldn't get that grant because it would be torture. It would be considered some kind of abnormal torture and yet this is what we do are doing to our young so I had this conversation with her and said Madre the network is going dark you need to know this at the very instant that we are lifting into the heavens that we are traveling into the solar system that we are carrying life to Mars one of the things that I did in this vision is I took the Madre to Mars because I've modeled every part of the solar system for NASA. Modeled all the vehicles, designed new ones, conceptual missions, notional missions, whatever NASA's terms are. And I've got a sense of the geography of the place. So in one of these journeys, I took the Madre to Mars. I took her to the moon first. Took her to, I think, Apollo 12's landing spot where Pete Conrad set her down like a baby and all those sorts of things. And the Madre put her hand into the lunar soil and said, this is dry. I could never survive here. And I said, well, let's come on and let's go further on. And we came down to Mars and we landed at the very border of the ice cap where there was melted water. And she put herself into that and said, I can live here. And I said, come on, let's go another place. We'll go down to the equatorial region where there's this weird-looking roving roller rover thing. And I know which one. It's the one that's been turned off. Took my screw gun and I dropped the belly pan off the bottom of this rover and said to her, put your hand on this vehicle. What do you feel? What do you sense? And she says, I feel life here. Thirteen kinds of bacteria are living in a desiccated environment just fine inside that belly pan. Life is on Mars. We've brought life to Mars. NASA tries to sterilize spacecraft, but it can't do the interior. They always get through. So life is on Mars. It's in stasis, maybe a little bit of metabolism. It's just waiting there. And it can wait there for millions of years until the conditions arise. So in my conversation with her, I said, yes, Mandre, there is hope. There is hope. So how do we get out of this pickle? Terrence used to talk about pickles, I think, if I'm not, not wrong, Dennis. How do we get out of this circumstance that we're in? This is like the best Hollywood thriller, right? The best Hollywood thriller, Jerry Bruckheimer film, where... 
at the last minute, just as you're about to go to ascendancy, this dark force comes in, and it's called mobile phones and technology. The snake comes in in its final attack, and we're just about to ascend. And the Madre is just about to give up that there's a future home. You know, you could write the script for this movie, but we're living the movie right now. And the planet's being completely denuded. The plants are being burned. The rainforest is being destroyed. The Madre is giving everything up for this. She's giving her all. It's the greatest movie ever written. And we're living in the great crescendo. We're living in that this time, right? I think there is one thing that is coming back that is the, that third powerful force that is going to come in, and it's coming in from the right angle. You know how in Hollywood film, there's like, it's either the cavalry is coming, or the girl picks up the gun and shoots the guy, you know, and she's on off camera, but she's actually, she's going to shoot the crook. This is what's happening. Let's rewind. Do you want to hear the last part of the story? You're, 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 you're still following me? Okay, the last part of the story is what is coming in from left of field that is going to make this all work? Well, 200,000 years ago, in a cave in South Africa called the Blombos Cave, they have found, or currently they have found, ashes upon ashes layers with shells, with ochre, with bits of bone with markings in it, accounting system, something like that double entry accounting maybe even and in this cave at 180,000 years is the first modern humans it's amazing it's one of the great discoveries in, in uh, paleoanthropology is that my god there they are at the same time we know that Africa was dried out in that period it was really a, a mess we also know that there were other human hominid lines quite a few of them living all over Africa. So there's lots of competition. But in this one area, we find the evidence of modern humans. Here's the fourth piece of the puzzle. We also find that we are coming out of one mother. All of human beings today carry a gene for the mitochondria that's the same. So they name her mitochondrial Eve the mother to all of humanity. We come from a single woman. How was this possible? Other animal species, they have variation. You know, rabbits have variation. They don't all come from one girl rabbit. There's variation, not with us. We come from one woman. Who was she? Where did she live? So in my conceit, in my imagination, in my dream, I say perhaps she lived in Blombos Cave. She was born with a mutation. She was born with a rockingly good mutation. Maybe it gave her language. Maybe it gave her a bigger brain suddenly. But whatever it was, her genes marched on to conquer the world. Nothing survived the onslaught of her genes. They were so powerful. You had to either breed with mitochondrial Eve's offspring or you were gone. That's how strong her mutation was. So imagine her as a woman. She's born into this community, and these other women are like, whoa, this one is something. They probably protected her. They probably knew what she was. They probably protected her from the males. The males, because it's Blombos Cave, are fishermen. The males are not going and hunting in the veldt because they're a coastal community. They're eating shellfish. Fishing communities are almost always very peaceful. The ocean makes it peaceful. The fact that you're collecting things, you're not hunting. So this was a very interesting place for mitochondrial Eve to, to be born. So the males were kind of off doing their stuff, but the females were the center of that world, the absolute center of that world. They raised mitochondrial Eve. They protected her, and then they became her students. She probably invented everything. She probably invented gossip. So gossip was an important part of this community. She invented language in order to have gossip. Because before that, they were just sort of making sounds, but they're trying to make sounds about the idiot things that the males were doing. But they need to put words to those things. 
And so she said, we're going to invent language. We can have gossip about the males. And we're even going to invent, I'm going to invent mathematics. So we can count up what each of these males brings in and doesn't. So we can kind of do stuff and we can figure out how much food we've got and run our community. And then she probably invented uh, spiritual vision. She probably invented four or five things in her lifetime. Think of mitochondrial E. What an amazing, amazing human being. And then her genes went on to spread across the planet. In my conceit and in my dream, my dream was that the males got wind of her. This is we're getting great wind flowing through here. And they said, oh my god, we got competition. She is so totally smart and so totally dominant. The males, no matter what they would do, she would say, oh please, oh please. She was so much smarter than them. So they got in their heads this idea that they had to do something. In my dream, in my conceit, they stole her child. They stole the future child. And they made for the interior. And they carried that girl who carried her gene into East Africa. Because you can see the spread. If you, do, if you do your own DNA, you can watch the spread of your DNA from Africa out. If you do go, go online and you spit in a tube and you send it in the mail, you can watch how this happened for you personally. Well, it probably happened for her. Her genes moved into Africa, carried by these recalcitrant males that carried the future child. So they did a deed for us. They carried her genes throughout the world to make the world we have now. But they rediscovered and reinvented the culture of uh, bloodlust. They took up the spear again, and they started to... Uh, to kill the animal. They killed the sacred kudu. They killed in order to live. They left the peaceable community. It's my belief that what is happening now at the very last minute in Hollywood terms is the return of mitochondrial Eve. Because what's happening? Mitochondrial Eve, why is this happening? All over the planet, women are rising into positions of power and strength. Why is that happening? Because the ultimate spear carrying, picking up of the spear, bloodlust thing that the male manic monkey did was to invent thermonuclear war. And the thermonuclear war head is the ultimate spear that could never be used. It had to be taken down. It was taken apart in the 1990s with the end of the Cold War because Nothing could allow that to happen. The Madre couldn't allow that to happen. We couldn't allow that to happen. Thermonuclear war would have done what the Madre does with asteroids, only probably worse. End of the whole story. So the, the bloodlust male was pulled back for the first time in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of history, and, and there was stalled. And I believe what is coming is mitochondrial Eve's return. And every person knows, knows this here. I think you can feel it. You can feel it in the change in politics in Europe. You can feel it in, as, as feminine power is rising. And it's rising fast. It's rising everywhere. And I think that is what we need, that counterbalancing mechanism to basically knock the spear-carrying male off that pedestal, let the center of, of the human world come back to the women's circle, and we can finally get get this thing back. We can save our civilization. And with that, uh, how much time are we? A little bit. Do you want to know the last part of the story? The last part of the story is the ascension. So, so what's that? Tell you. Okay. So the last part, because I, I promised ascension and I haven't delivered it. I've delivered you the Hollywood movie without that final crazy scene that, that you all love in great Hollywood sci-fi thrillers or just about any movie now. So what is the ascension? Guess what it is. How many of you in any way through yoga, breathwork, spirit medicines, injury, extreme sports, have had a moment where you saw the face of God, you saw something so huge that you couldn't possibly conceive of it. It was so massive. How many of you have seen that? 
You seen that? This is the start of ascension. 2,000 years ago, a few people did that kind of a trick. You know, people that we now call the Buddha or Jesus or, you know, the, the various people, the various bodhisattvas, did that with their techniques. They could reach that state. Today, millions of people are bumping into that thing, that object. You know, Terence may have called it the transcendental object at the end of time or space or something, but I think of that as the, the almost like the Ur object at the beginning and the end of the universe the ascension object. So here's a theory about how that works. And it's something I'm now posing to my neurobiology friends. And that theory is that if you rattle the brain, you really shake it up in some way. And it could be a near-death experience. The brain's a quantum dynam dynamical machine. Sorry for the dust. But uh, this always happens to me, believe me, out at Burning Man. Is the, the yurt was blown apart one year and I was still there talking. But, uh, so think of the brain as like the Los Angeles freeway system. This is back to Jerry Bruckheimer. You rattle the LA freeway system and the cars that are driving along all pop into neutral. So the people are like, oh, my engine's falling out and I'm in neutral, I don't know what's going on. What this means is there's uncertainty about where the electron should go. It normally goes down that sodium channel. It's been doing it for hundreds of millions of years, keeping its schedule. But there's a temporary uncertainty. When uncertainty appears in a system like that, you get a bloom of what are called the Feynman sum over histories that come out from that particle. You can do this in this two-slit experiment in your kitchen, where suddenly there are these waves that come out, and then the waves start to collapse. I call the wave phase a flash. That's the flash when all possibility opens. It's so big that you can't grok it. The flash occurs. Then these sums over histories collapse down, and they collapse down into the normal path of the electron that was there before. However, it's a symmetrical collapse. So the electron is, oh, good, I'm back on the road, which he never left, but it's equal probable that I go backwards as I go forwards. This is what I call the post-flash, because for a period of time that's a little bit longer than the flash, the electron could actually go the other way. What does this mean? That the electron could take any path through the mind, and if you count up the path through the mind that an electron can take, it's bigger, those numbers of paths are bigger than the countable particles in the universe. So for that period of time, your little manic monkey brain is bigger than the universe informationally. It's potentiated a system of awareness that actually each one of those paths could resonate with every particle in the universe and more. And so the final end of the story, my folks, my, my friends, is that when the potentiated brain happens, it's like a transmitter. It's like a wobbling transmitter that goes wobble, 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 wobble with this, all this information, all these combinatorial pathways, quantum dynamical, it touches all the particles in the universe. It has the capability of touching more than that because it's bigger than that as a transmitter and it touches them and the whole thing shakes. So the next monkey brain gets potentiated and the universe is wobbled and shaken. And it's my conceit, my dream, my belief that as we do this in this wonderful Hollywood moment, we are waking up Big Daddy Universe. And we do this more and more. We're rattling and we're, we're resonating with this huge system that's even bigger than the Madre. So to close the story, we're closing the story, picture the Madre. It's the year 2050 or something like that. She's sitting in her lawn chair at the last patch of rainforest that we haven't destroyed. But it's totally okay. Why? Because we as a species have gotten centered in our male and femaleness. We have used our technology and mastered things and learned about science and we've, we've regained the power of eye contact in our communities. We've built this incredibly strong huddle ball and we are rising. We are rising and she's sitting in that lawn chair and she sees not the globule of death rising 
that will cause the, the planet to burn, but she's seeing the primate. The monkey is ascending because we've just done enough of this potentiating and wobbling and talking to the universe in our collector crazy minds that we are now ascending because we've woke up the consciousness of the cosmos. And she's saying, okay, kitties, <laughs> good on you. Thank God my job is done. It's been a long road. It wouldn't have worked with the arthropods. It would have been my last shot. I'm taking a break. I'm kicking back and regrowing my force, and they're ascending, and they have connected with all. So that's the end of the uh, five-part story. Thank you very much. I have no idea if there are any time for questions or if we should be introducing four potential questions from potentiated mad monkeys. Four minutes, four moments, that's an etern almost an eternity of, of time. I'll repeat your question. Do I see a potential time frame for all this happening? The question was, do, how long is this going to take? Do you see a potential time frame? You mean for the ascension bit or the mitochondrial Eve bit? To get to the end of the story from where we are, I think you're doing it right here. One, it, when you come out here and you get into these dance stages and you connect with all the people, if you get out of yourself and you start really being present with other people and you, you put joy, you come from joy and you put joy in your eye contact, every time you do that, you're potentiating the whole thing. So really, it's up to us. Do we do this in first gear? Do we, do we move it up to second gear? Probably we should, because time is it's a Hollywood movie, right? You got, <laughs> it's a car chase. So it's happening, I don't know. Is it in a human lifetime? Is it in two or three human lifetimes? I think it probably has to be by mid-century. <clears throat> because if we don't, we're going to have used up the last rainforest, and we're going to... So in the Hollywood script, right, there still has to be a little bit of juice left in the system before this great ending. So kind of track it out <laughs> I think I, th I think it's within the lifetimes of some of the people here or of this wonderful little girl that was here potentially I, I'm, I'm like Terrence I'm not going to pick a date <laughs> not not smart no <laughs> as Dennis said So the question is, what is the ascension? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it mean? I think it's bigger than anything we could ever possibly conceive in our little heads. It's, it's something so grand. And so it's derivative of that thing that you see when you see the face of God or the totality. It's that, but on a massive scale affecting everybody. I mean, it could be the good old apocalyptic ascension type thing, but... Uh, it's something bigger we can than we can know. Do we leave form? Or are we just energy? I think we're still going to be able to have a burger, fries, and shake diet. But um, I, I tell you the truth, you know, when you when you shake, rattle, and roll something like the cosmos, what you're going to get it's not going to be like close encounters of the third kind. It's going to be something beyond conception. Because what do we all want? We all want connectedness, right? We're going to practically sacrifice our entire connectedness with technology, but before that snake eats our asses, we're going to get that connectedness back. And the only way we're going to get it back is by fighting hard for it in the ball, in the eye contact, in the love puddle, or whatever it is, and we're going to find that power again. So it's going to be something like that. I don't know if we'll be in our bodies, I, it's, it's something huge. The question's in the way in the back. Or, oh, shout it out. Shout it out, Zari. Do you think there is other planets out there with, say, Padres waiting around in their lawn chair to look up with the Madre? <laughs> you know what? There, by the laws of probability, there's got to be a planet somewhere there's a symbiosis festival going on. <laughs> and something like, it's probably called... Zimbiosis or something, you know, there's one 
and there's probably some weird character like me with four heads and five feet and whatnot that's telling this story to unbelieving audiences. Um, and that um, that resonance is happening. It's just the universe is so big it has to be. So I'd love a ticket to that festival. Go right right from here to there. You can imagine what their DJs are like. Oh my God. Uh, we're... The portal is in the tea house. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, it, one more. Stessa. Question? We're in the state already. I think you can choose to live in a state like this. Sometimes when I'm doing my yoga and stuff, I have this sense of an opening inside. And it's like an opening to something amazing and beautiful and big and wonderful. Own that. Maybe that's a piece of what we're going toward. Own that state. Don't just say, oh, it's great yoga today, but I'm going back to do my email or my Twitter feed or whatever. No, 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 no. You're being given a message. Try to make that state a little bit bigger and wider and more enveloping and filling your heart more and filling your mind. Let it in. Let it in. And I think with that, uh, thank, you. thank you, everyone. <laughs> you, you can stay, you have a thing to read, or what? You, or, or, you no, I have, I have nothing to read. No, we're just going to co co cavort here uh, as we are about to welcome Dennis McKenna. Yes. Ah, and uh, and also, you know, let us note the power of this gathering. We are at the last day of summer. Um, and the equinox that we're approaching, this time, a powerful time of dedication. Dedication magnetizes the opportune story. Opportune well, story. Yes, yes. And uh, the only thing I can say about Dennis is, uh, is just, uh, it's nothing that you can say about Dennis. Uh, between the work that Dennis has done in science and the work that Dennis did with Terence, and the storytelling, the masterful storytelling from both, uh, it has created a different world than would otherwise have been. And if you don't know about their story, of course, Dennis has the, the book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Through their research, what I would say is between Dennis and Terrence, or Terrence and Dennis, it's really kind of a combo, they have provided a doorway to that final ascension for all of us. And they've also done the research. They've gone through that doorway and come back with stories and mind intact. And I think that the brothers McKenna, they have lifted us all up to that point where we can now take the next few steps on the ladder to uh, get us there. So we owe them an enormous debt that we cannot uh, ever repay except by taking the next few steps on the ladder. It's going to be five, it's going to, be five to seven minutes, uh, so everybody stay around. But let's, let's, uh, let's animate those five to seven minutes. All right. <laughs> How should we do this? Um, I, I also like, you know, the, the model um, you know, conversations with Karen's going ascension, yes, but simultaneous descension. Exactly, and you're taking, you're looking through through the pixels. I'm getting, I'm, I'm communing with my snake here. That is perfect. You know, part of what we all know in our bones and our blood that you know this moment in time, this equinox has been celebrated for twenty five thousand years. It's where the light of the sun was invited to animate this guiding story. So yeah, we have the McKenna's as great bards and troubadours <laughs> and that quality of all of us being storytellers. Uh, so, you know, Homer begins by sitting in Neo Muse and through us tell the story. So, exactly, to and fro. I forgot to mention, it might be interesting, the, the um, NASA dusted me off, uh, pre-Burning Man, they dusted me off in May and brought me back there. I hadn't been there in four years to design a mission get this, to figure out if life can exist in asteroids, on asteroids and comets in the solar system. And this was cool because I'm sort of on this track and here I get this call and General Pete Conrad, uh, Pete uh, Warden, Pete Conrad's passed away, but, and I go down there and it's now public and it's been submitted to headquarters in what's called an RFI, Request for Information, and it's seven spirals of this mission design that will get you to get this. This is really quite trippy. 
you see a comet moving through the solar system. Sometimes they're called wet neos, and they're spraying out water and methane and carbon dioxide, and they're kind of sloppy. And if you can catch up to it with a spacecraft, you can wrap a balloon around it. A balloon. Yes, you can. So you wrap a balloon around it, and now it fills up the balloon, goes poop, kind of like a Wiley E. Coyote cartoon. And you have a spigot on the end and a little cable tie to the asteroid. And you can move that thing with its own gases. This is the mission design. I came up with this when I was in high school in the 70s, but finally I get to submit this thing. So now you can power the comet, and you can move it to low Earth orbit. And you can go with a spacecraft and connect to that spigot, kick the valve, and fill up your tanks and go on to the next places. You have a filling station. You have another one in low Earth and lunar orbit and another one in trans-Mars orbits. And you've got a low-cost space system. But at the same time, you can take those balls of, they got liquid, they got gas, they got a rocky core, they're a little planet. They are a biosphere. So you take a couple of your gas stations, you inject biota into them, you inject life into them, and it will live. It will live. And then what you, what you can do, you can like make your popsicles and your tofu from this stuff. So, but it's, it's a way to make an extant life in the solar system all on a low budget. You know, this is all going to be super low budget. We can fund this through Indiegogo, for God's sakes. But anyway, so that got done and submitted. If you write to me at bruce at damer.com, I'll send it to you. But last point, because I think um, he's almost ready. If you want to hear this rap and other stories, believable or not, they're all at levityzone.com. Levityzone.com. It's a takeoff on Terence's old levity and novelty site, but it's new. It's science plus vision equals hope is our theme. And it's stuff like this. And if you're a musician, we need your music. If you're an artist, we need your art. It's called a radically inclusive podcast where each episode we blend in contributions from the community. And we need your voices. If you have a conversation that fits these themes, send it in. It will become a podcast. So it's a kind of a new kind of podcast. So levityzone.com. If you want to reach me, it's uh, you can use get at levityzone.com or bruce at damer.com. So enough of a plug. Excellent, excellent. So we have the visionary technocrats, a plethora of looming of stories, and the radical traditionalists. So the visionary technocrats, you take off and miss the population load off. The radical traditionalists, deep root in democratic animism, cooperating with nature. That's a good vision, yeah? Good, good. Yeah. so because the, the girls say, no, no leaving the planet until the boys have cleaned the room, then you can go. Yeah, but again, clean your room. So, exactly. <laughs> That's good. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Levity Zone. Dr. Bruce is taking a brief hiatus from the zone, heading south for a retreat in the green zone just over the Peruvian Andes. So stand by for a month or so when I will deliver the Burning Man's spiels to your ears. Great thanks go out to the organizers of Symbiosis, including Caroline Casey, for putting on such an exquisite event. Also, I would like to personally thank Fabio Scalabroni for equally exquisite tracks from the beat version of his composition, Stone Bird. This was used as our intro and outro music, which you will hear next. Jacob Amon is also most graciously thanked for his steadfast support of the Levity Zone site and for producing the cover art for this and all of the other podcasts. See you in a while back in the zone with many more a tale to tell.